What's up guys and welcome to the Vicious Syndicate Report number 235 of Meta Review. As always, I want to start by saying that uh, I'm not associated with Vicious Syndicate in any way whatsoever. Um, it's all the word work of uh, these fine people right here. I'm actually kind of surprised to see this list is a lot smaller than it was. I guess they've updated, but uh, I don't have anything to do with it. I don't collect the data. I don't analyze the data. I'm just a fan of what these people do. I believe you can follow all of them on Twitter if you so choose, if you want additional insights from them. Uh, these are all, you know, just great, very knowledgeable people within the Hearthstone community. And of course, Vicious Syndicate, the most influential publication within the Hearthstone community. Just really like what they do, and I like to share that with you guys uh, as a new report comes out. So this is a very much anticipated report for me, simply because this is the first Vicious Syndicate report that's going to have the data from uh, all of the Prince Renathal decks, 40 card decks, something brand new to Hearthstone. It's really shaken up the meta, and uh, it's definitely changed a lot of things and caused a lot of experimentation in what was probably a pretty solved meta just before that came out. So I'm um, going in to get started here. Uh, viciousyndicate.com if you'd like to check this out for yourself they also do have other things available to look at if you're interested and then uh, just note that uh, they have these different bars here so uh, it's really interesting to see how the meta changes as you move up through the ranks here you can see a, a common theme throughout the ladder is that there's lots of press store druids just up and down the ladder it's probably a deck that you've run into if you've been playing uh, druid of course uh, probably the most consistent renathal deck it does have to put 10 extra bad cards in the deck to be able to play Renathal and to get uh, access to that 40 health total. But it's extremely consistent because of things like Aquatic Form, Moonlit Guidance, Jerry Rig Carpenter, and Cold Tooth Mine. You're basically guaranteed to be able to find Lady Prestor. So I don't think in facing the deck, I have never seen my opponents play Lady Prestor any later than turn six. They always have it. And I've seen it as early as turn three. Coin, Innervate, Innervate, Lady Prestor. So. Uh, as you can imagine, I ended up losing that game, but uh, just a very consistent 40-card deck. Most of the other 40-card decks not performing all that well, and uh, I think of interest to uh, certainly a not small number of people is Diamond 1 to Diamond 4. You can just kind of see what you're expecting if you're trying to finish up that Legend Climb. Uh, going down to the class frequency discussion, introduction of Renathal changed the format so much there was no report last week just because all their data was uh, basically worthless at that point because so many people were experimenting with Renathal. Um, and then you can see here Druid numbers at Legends 25%. Malfurion is back after Druid was uh, one of the worst decks in the format um, just before Renathal came out. And so you're likely going to be seeing a lot of uh, Nerf Guff. <laughs> Everybody still hates Guff. Poor Guff. Uh, some things don't change and that's Rogue being everywhere. Rogue is just a fun class. People are going to play Rogue. Uh, there is a lot of random with the things like Jackpots and Reconnaissance, but uh, people enjoy that. People enjoy the Maestra decks, playing Knolls. So you're probably always going to be able to see a lot of Rogue. Uh, Quest Priest attracted a lot of Renathal enthusiasts. I know Tice, probably one of the more popular content creators and streamers, uh, was playing a lot of Quest Priest and also brought it to the recent Masters Tour and actually did really well. So uh, definitely some interest in Quest Priest. I've seen it on the ladder, which is uh, surprising. Uh, Quest Priest has actually maybe finally found a place in the meta after all these months. Mage's popularity remains intact. Uh, big Spell Mage making waves. Mech Mage more common at lower ranks. And uh, some Wildfire Mage, not very much. I haven't actually seen any Wildfire Mage. Uh, no significant changes in Shaman. They've got the two Murloc decks. Of course, the Aggro Murloc deck as well as the uh, more controlly version of the Murloc deck that runs like the Snowfall Guardians, schooling, things like that. And uh, some Burn Shaman. I haven't faced Burn Shaman in quite a long time, which is pretty interesting here. But nobody's really experimenting with Renathal in Shaman. It's just too hard to be able to uh, play Renathal and then find nine other cards. You just dilute your deck so much. So you're, with the Renathal decks, you're adding an additional 33% cards. You know, you got a 30 card deck, you got to put in 10 more cards, one of which is Renathal. So then you have to find nine other cards. And with the current card pool, there's just not enough quality cards to be able to make these decks good in most cases. So nobody really experimenting with Renathal and Shaman, at least anymore. Um, lots of Renathal in Warlock. Uh, Curse Warlock, people are playing Renathal. I guess uh, people feel like, you know, the extra 10 life gives them um, a chance to kind of put together their curses to be able to do the damage. Um, and Curse Warlock is actually seeing more play rate. 
uh, class with life tap was tipped by many to be one of the best fits for the legendary of course you know maybe you can life tap more freely if you have 10 extra health to be able to play with i don't know if that's necessarily true or not just because warlock also has the most healing available in the game usually uh you know whenever i play warlock i'm not thinking oh my health total is so low i can't tap um, that's pretty rare Hunter's popularity follows a familiar pattern of being high outside of Legend while dipping at Legend. What's happening within the archetypes is interesting. Big Beast and Quest have seen Renathal builds emerge, and uh, relatively later than other classes. So it was kind of an afterthought. I guess people thought maybe, you know, with Hunter, the 10 extra life would not be as big of a benefit. But uh, I think it turns out that maybe those are some of the better Renathal decks. It's actually a Hunter decks. Why would we want Renathal and Hunter? That's a good question. Uh... While it has encouraged some classes, Renathal seems to have scared away others. Demon Hunter's damage-based win condition seems to have influenced the lower play rate. Holy Paladin and Control Warrior have significantly shrunk in numbers. <laughs> Finally! <laughs> I've been waiting for that, man. I've always said people playing Control Warrior are griefers, man. It's like how you grief your opponent in Hearthstone is with Control Warrior. And the same with Holy Paladin. The games are so long, it's just brutal. Like, when you're used to, you know, 6, 8, 10 minute games, and then all of a sudden you get to play a 25 or 30 minute game, it's just awful. So, uh, now I think the Griefers have moved on to Quest Priest. That's where the really long games are, man. It's just punishments. Even if you win, you feel like you've lost because of the amount of time you've had to play. I really think there's a strong argument to just concede and go next. Because the amount of time it takes to play out a 25 minute game... You could concede and lose, and you could potentially win three games in that amount of time, and then still come out like plus two. Uh, which decks are strong in the format, and where is Renathal worth playing? Answers now. Um, they do have the heat map here. You can check this out for yourself. I'm not going to go over this, but uh, some interesting data here. Of course, you know, the brighter or darker green it is, the better the matchup is, and the darker red it is, the worse the matchup is. So you can kind of find out. Uh, your deck of choice, how you're going to be lining up against other things on the ladder. Vicious Syndicate power win rates, um, they only break this down to, uh, you know, these three brackets. But if you're on the climb to Legend, um, you can see here from uh, Diamond 4 down to Diamond 1, uh, there's actually, what is this, six Tier 1 decks. And so I did a live stream recently, and uh, if you were able to catch that, thank you. Appreciate you stopping by. But I had a question during the stream about the meta from uh, Diamond 4 to Diamond 1, and I actually have no clue because uh, I'm only in that bracket for one, maybe two days at the beginning of the month, and then I get back into Legend, so uh, I'm not really familiar with what's going to be going on there, but I will say, when you look at this, there are three aggro decks that are Tier 1 in the Diamond 4 to Diamond 1 Legend, so if you're playing to uh, try to hit Legend, or maybe even get Legend for the first time, I've always been a proponent of Pick an aggro deck, and the reasons why are because aggro decks have shorter, quicker games, which allows you to be able to maximize the amount of time that you have set aside to play Hearthstone. I know people play for different amounts. You've got casuals, you've got hardcore casuals, you've got people that are grinding. So for a comparison, you know, the big time grinders are playing, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 games of Hearthstone a month. I consider myself to be what I would call a hardcore casual. I'm a casual, you know, I'm not trying to hit rank one legend, I'm not trying to play competitive. Um, but I still like to, to have a good rank, at least in comparison to what I consider to be a good rank. But I'm only playing three to four hundred games a month. So there are actually people who are playing more games in a week than I'm playing in an entire month. So, And then you have people that play even less than that, you know. Uh, sometimes you don't play every day, even I don't play every day playing three to four hundred games a month. You may go an entire week without a game, so uh, just playing these aggro decks to be able to maximize the amount of time that you're playing, if you're trying to hit Legend, and even take Legend out of that conversation, if your goal is to, say, like hit Platinum for the first time, or hit Diamond for the first time, or just get back to those ranks because it's a rank you've had previously, then play an aggro deck. It allows you to maximize your time, short games, and then you can see here there's actually three really strong aggro decks currently in the format. Mech Mage, Mech Paladin, Murloc Shaman. Mech Mage and Mech Paladin, there is going to be some overlap with the neutral mechs that are being played. Um, and I know a lot of times it's going to be co uh, collection-based. You know, you may not necessarily have a lot of legendaries and things like that. And to be honest, I, I don't think that super matters. So you think about Mech Mage, maybe you don't have the, uh, the Colossal, the Mech Colossal Gaia. Um, you can still play Mech Mage. You know, that's a good card that does make the deck better. But you're not going to be giving up large percentages of your win rate just because you don't have that one legendary 
the deck works just fine without it. Just find another mech to stick in, um, and you should be fine. You know, don't don't ever let that discourage you. There are things that you can do if you don't have you know a full set or you can't make the entire deck. But if you want to hit legend or if you want to break new ground with your rank, um, you're going to have to play an established meta deck. You're you know extremely unlikely, like more than 99% unlikely, that you're going to be able to create your own homegrown deck and be able to do well with it. You know, meme decks, off meta decks. You can play those to have fun. Not everybody's goal is to have a, a better rank or even a good rank in Hearthstone. Sometimes you just want to have fun with the deck you're playing, and that's fine. But if you are trying to get a better rank, you're trying to hit Legend, you're trying to hit, you know, break new ground for your personal rank, um, play a good deck and play an aggro deck. You're going to get there faster than anything else. And, you know, if you are in this Diamond 4 to Diamond 1 range and you've never been Legend, um, you have the skill it takes to be legend. It's just a numbers game at some point It just comes down to the number of games that you're gonna have to play to get there You know once you hit a diamond five, you know, you've got to go, you know, roughly uh, Plus 15 you've got to win 15 more games than you lose by the end of the month to actually be able to break into Legends and uh, a lot of times it's a numbers game. It's a time game um, And that's just the way it is and unfortunately the biggest bummer is sometimes you're going to get to diamond one you're going to be on the final boss you lose and then you go on a lose streak you go back down to diamond five don't let it discourage you you just got to brush that off a little bit it happens to everybody it happened to me three times in one month i was so frustrated that you know i couldn't get back to legend and you know legend is a rank that i'm pretty familiar with i spend basically all my time in hearthstone at legend and i really struggled one month um and it's happened to everybody. You know, you think about your favorite content creator, you know, your favorite Twitch streamer, your favorite YouTuber. You've probably seen it with your own eyes. Everybody's had those times. So you go from one to five, maybe you get back to three, and then you go back to four. It happens. Don't let it affect your mental state. Just stay positive. If you play enough games, you're going to be able to get there. And, uh, you know, if you're not able to play that number of games, don't let it discourage you. It doesn't mean anything about your skill level. It doesn't mean anything about how good you are at the game. And I think for a lot of us, I've fallen into this trap. You know, your Hearthstone rank doesn't mean anything to your value as a person. Don't let it make you feel bad. Uh, just keep on grinding, and you'll definitely get there eventually. If not this month, then, you know, sometime in the near future. And then you can also see, I mean, Murloc, Warlock, again, that's another aggro deck, right? Not necessarily on the cusp. Uh, tier 1 decks are considered anything with a 52% win rate, so a big drop-off from, you know, say like Murloc Shaman to Murloc Warlock, but, uh, yeah, I think we've covered that pretty well. Going on down here, I always skip this, um, the Vicious Synd Syndicate meta score. <laughs> I have no idea what this means. Like, I can read this and I can interpret it. I still have no idea what this means or why I would, uh, you know, want to spend time on this, so, uh, you know, if you guys have figured that out and you think that's useful information, definitely hit me up in the comments and uh, you can put me on the right track there. Uh, coming down here to the power ranking discussion, Druid, Prester Druid, perceived to be a menace on the ladder. I hate facing it, man. It, it just feels like such a high roller deck, man. These guys are high rolling me and it makes me angry. <laughs> Not angry, but slightly frustrated. I don't get mad at, uh, at wizard poker. Also, another good point here is there's no expectation of a fair fight in wizard poker. Um, if you're expecting the game to be fair or or anything like that, I think uh, you know you're just kind of setting yourself up for a big fall there. Uh, it's a deck that seems to take advantage of popularity of some underperforming decks in the format, which means uh, as people you know get away from underperforming decks, this deck is going to lose strength as well. Uh, Prester Druid strong against pass passive decks that are incapable of pressuring it effectively to punish its weak early game and absence of notable defensive tools. So I agree with that statement. If you're going to be able to beat um, Prester Druid, in a lot of cases, you have to beat them, you know, before or just after they get Lady Prester down. Once they start getting into dragons, you know, there's just dragons that are really, really strong. They have strong effects and, uh, you know, their stats don't necessarily matter. And then, of course, if they're able to uh, get a Kazakazan and play it and get to the treasures, you know, that's that's pretty much game ending at that point. But what I will say is the way this is written, it kind of makes it sound like uh, Druid just rolls over in the early game and it doesn't. Because my experience is, you know, in the mulligan for Prester Druid, you're looking for Lady Prester, you're looking for Guff. And then you're looking for ways to be able to tutor Lady Prester. So you keep Guff, keep Prester. You're going to keep like Jerry Rig Carpenter. You keep Cold Tooth Mine. Um, and then, you know, with a 40 card deck, the mulligans get really interesting too because if something is kind of okay, can you afford to throw it away and then risk making your hand worse? 
um, I think it's a little bit harder, especially for decks that aren't Druid, to make those mulligan decisions. You know, if you have something that's like serviceable and you're like, okay, I can get by with this, I personally believe that you have to hang on to it. Because with a 40 card deck, again, we've got 10 bad cards we've shoved into uh, our deck, and it's just really hard to get that mulligan consistency. So, uh, but you could consider maybe keeping like a Moonlit Guidance or an Aquatic Form if you were struggling to find a way to be able to tutor out that Lady Prester Druid. Uh, but they're not totally defenseless in the early game. You know, you see things like uh, Trog come down on turn one, sometimes Watch Post on two, and then you're having to make decisions about whether or not, you know, you need to trade into the Watch Post. Can I live with my cards being one mana more expensive? Or, you know, do I have to deal with this Trog because the deck that I'm playing is casting spells and I'm making their board wider? So a lot of times the minions that Druid are playing in that early game are actually going to enable them to be able to fight against your early board. So Druid, not totally helpless, but I do agree uh, for most decks, you're going to have to be able to pressure their health total in order to be able to win that matchup. Um, we suspect it'll decline in play, perhaps stay overplayed like Ramp, Druid, uh, Ramp Druid was. You know, it just has a, a feeling of uh, strength, playing Prester, playing Guff. People tend to like decks like that, uh, whether or not they perform well or not. And uh, it's a deck that needed Renathal to be competitive, and we explain why in the Druid section. Uh, Celestial Druid benefited from the introduction of Renathal, uh, not because of using it. Pretty much 30 card alignment is better than a uh, you know 40 card alignment deck. It's just that with these Renathal decks, uh, it's created a favorable field for the archetype to thrive in, especially at Legend. Uh, Celestial Druid punishes slow, janky decks that lack lethality. So you know people are playing a 40 card deck. It's a watered down deck. They're going to struggle to actually be able to close out games then that gives the Celestial Druid time to be able to play alignment and then go off with the Lady Anaconda and just do like ridiculous things and then all of a sudden you find that you know you have two mana your opponent has like six or seven and uh, you know you just can't do powerful things anymore at that point in the game uh, but definitely 30 card alignment is going to be better than 40 card alignment uh, Rogue's not the strongest class but it's good there's merit to both Vessel and Stash variants of Thief Rogue uh, Vessel is a bit stronger. My personal preference here is actually just the stash. Um, I think it's a little bit more fun and uh, you know for me just with my personal play style uh, I've had more consistency with uh, stash variants, contraband stash of course versus a Sharan Vessel but uh, I've seen people doing really well with Vessel. I've had people play Vessel against me and a Sharan Vessel into uh, Gone Fishing to dredge up you know the other half uh, if you can put 12 power on the board in one turn and your opponent can interact with it, it feels like a win in most cases. Uh, usually when that happens to me with the decks that I play, uh, it just feels like a game-ending turn. I can't deal with it. I take 12, and they're able to close out the game pretty quickly after that. Uh, Bomb Rogue is not doing too well. If you guys are familiar with the channel, you know I've been loving Bomb Rogue for quite a while. I just think it's a fun deck. Um, might be the deck hurt most by Renathal because Bomb Rogue does have a finite amount of damage. The 10 extra health actually just isn't that big of a deal, uh, in my opinion. I think, you know, Bomb Rogue, I had no problems being able to beat Control Warrior when Control Warrior was a thing. You can do the extra 10 damage, but it does take a little bit longer, and that gives your opponent time to be able to uh, deal with that win condition. Uh, interesting to note that the new build of Bomb Rogue with Smoke Screen exhibits quite the learning curve. We rate it only behind Boar Priest when it comes to skill ceiling. So the interesting thing here with this is, uh, you know, Bomb Rogue, they're saying it might take... Boar Priest, I had always heard that it took one to 200 games to be able to get really good at the deck and familiar with all the nuance. And they're saying, you know, uh, not as bad as at Boar Priest, but behind it. So, I mean, are, are you talking like 75 to 100 games of Bomb Rogue? That seems like an awful lot to get good at Bomb Rogue. But I do think there's some nuance with the uh, Burning Blade Acolytes and the bombs, the correct line of play to take when you have multiple death rattles uh, that have been played previously and the different things that are going on. So uh, I would say I'm not sure that it's worth playing that many games of Bomb Rogue to get, uh, you know, these kind of results. Uh, play it at a Tier 4. And, you know, maybe if you get good at the deck, it moves it into Tier 3 or low Tier 2. I just don't know that anybody wants to play that much unless you just really love the deck to be able to get those kind of win rates. Uh, Renathal is a good addition to Quest Priest. Quest Priest, again, it just needs time to be able to execute its win condition. And... In a lot of cases with Crest Priest, you don't necessarily care about how strong the individual card is. You just want to play cards on curve to complete the quest. Then you want to tutor your quest out of your deck with like a, a Thrive in the Shadows to be able to end the game on the spot once you can draw that uh, shard to be able to kill your opponent. 
Uh, deck has finally become competitive on ladder with a positive win rate all the way through Diamond, which is interesting. Nips at Legend with Druid's popularity becoming a problem at higher ranks, as well as relatively limited player agency. We suspect this deck will get worse over time and settle for mediocrity, which uh, doesn't hurt my feelings. I'm sure there's people that love Priest and love this deck. Uh, I just hate those decks that, that cause the 25-minute games. Uh, they could be gone and it wouldn't bother me whatsoever, but different strokes for different folks. I know people like control decks, they like slow decks, and, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. Naga Priest looks okay, but very matchup dependent. Success is riding on Druid's popularity, and it struggles against many decks that perform well, but aren't too popular yet. A rise in Mage and Shaman could be a problem here. Um, you know, Mage playing Box has a tendency to clear boards, you know, Mass, Polymorph, Flame Strike, so on and so forth. And then the uh, Shaman here, um, Naga Priest just really struggles because of all of Shaman's freeze effects. Naga Priest can only win by punching its opponent in the face with really big minions. You know, you have Wind Chills, you have um, Wild Paw Caverns bringing out those 3-4 elementals that can freeze minions and then of course once you get into Snowfall Guardians and Brilliant McCalls being able to repeat that effect you know you just kind of lock the board down and then the uh, Naga Priest actually can't do anything whatsoever. Boar Priest crippled by Celestial Druid it's just an unwinnable matchup I think it's like 95-5. Uh, even a top legend deck exhibits poor win rate so for people that spent you know all that time weeks being able to master Boar Priest playing all those games, and then now, unfortunately, uh, the deck just isn't very good anymore. Uh, no way around it when an oppressive matchup becomes popular. You need to get lucky and just not run into them, and you'd be happy to not run into Demon Hunter and Mage as well. So I don't see a whole lot of Demon Hunter. Mage does seem fairly popular. Uh, Big Spell Mage is good against uh, Boar Priest as well here. So Boar Priest just not doing too good at the current time. Uh, Big Spell Mage, one of the best decks in the format. Everywhere on the ladder, it's either best or second best. It's just extremely well-rounded and difficult to counter, which really strikes me as kind of strange because is Big Spell Mage anything other than Pile of Cards Mage? I mean, it's kind of crazy. It's almost like Rune of the Arc Mage plus 28. Um, I think that just kind of speaks to the power level of the current sets when a deck like Big Spell Mage is popular. And it took a lot of nerfs to cards in the current format to be able to make this deck popular. So uh, I have a feeling Big Spell Mage is going to be going away once the new set releases. Once more powerful options are available, it's just not going to be that good. But could be wrong about that. We'll see. Handles Renathal matchups well and beats both Druid decks convincingly, just very strong. Mech Mage is tier 1 every rank bracket before falling to tier 4 at top legend. Strong choice to climb with, as I was talking about earlier. Uh, weak choice to get number 1 legend with. We've said it before, but it compares to Quest Warrior. Basically, once you get into legend, and especially high legend, people know what your plays are. You're not going to be able to surprise them. You're not going to really be able to outplay them with Mech Mage. And they're able to take lines of play accordingly. So, I never see Mech Mage at the rank that I'm playing at. Um, I actually played 1 a couple of days ago for the first time. Um, I, I think I was playing uh, Quest Hunter, and I actually beat that Mech Mage, won that matchup. Um, so it was kind of strange to see, but uh, it just uh, doesn't have the power level once you get into Legend. But on the way to Legend, or on the way to you know whatever rank you've set a goal for, I think Mech Mage is really strong and a perfectly fine deck to be playing. Uh, estimate that Wildfire Mage's best and most curated build is a Tier 3 performer, so likely, unless you just love the deck and have tons of fun, it's not going to be worth your time to be playing it. Uh, not terrible, but hard to find a reason to play it over Big Spell Mage. Is Shaman just the strongest class in the game? It's hard to argue against with Murloc and Murloc Control Shaman looking very powerful across the ladder, making up two of the three best performing decks at Top Legend. So you have options here. You can go for the aggro Murloc deck, and then you can go for the more... Uh, to me, it's more kind of a mid-range rather than a control deck, but you get into semantics. What is mid-range? What is control? But definitely Shaman is just a super strong class, so, uh, you know, Shaman Enthusiasts, you're in a great spot right now. Control Shaman can be hard countered by Quest Priest or Curse Warlock, uh, but that means you're playing Quest Priest or Curse Warlock. It's a good point there. Uh, the only other very slightly unfavorable that's popular is Big Spell Mage. Not too difficult to understand why this is a good deck. It's just really well-rounded. Um, I think it has, you know, fun and interesting plays as well. And uh, just good against the field. Murloc Shaman Success is more matchup dependent. It's absolutely thriving right now because it destroys Druid like no other deck. So if you're sick of losing to Druids, just play the aggressive version of Murloc Shaman. And uh, it's also the best counter to Big Spell Mage. Uh, there's ways to stop it, but those options aren't common, which is why it's good everywhere on the ladder. 
Uh, Burn Shaman could be good as well. We're seeing some refinement that could propel it to Tier 2. It will struggle to gain traction because the Murloc decks are just better. So, uh, I mean, there could actually be a decent Burn Shaman deck out there that's going to go relatively undiscovered or certainly underplayed just because the class, the Shaman class, has two stronger decks. So that's, that's pretty interesting to think about when you think about decks possibly not being discovered in a, in a meta, even with millions of people playing them and all the data research that's being done. Curse Warlock looks weak. Renathal seems to be a trap that made the archetype worse. If you like Curse Warlock, take out Renathal, get rid of the bad cards. You're going to have more success with the 30-card version. Uh, loss of the deck's consistency and finding its win condition resulted in worsening results. All that really means is you shove those 10 extra bad cards into your deck. Now you can't find your curses, and you're going to struggle to close out games. Um, even with the 10 extra health buying you just a little extra time. Uh, Gul'dan wins our Bait of the Week medal. Congratulations. Take Renathal out of your curse deck. Murloc Warlock, similar to Murloc Shaman, it beats Druid and Big Spell Mage convincingly, but it's a worse deck overall, which is why it hasn't gained much in popularity. But Murloc Shaman, you know, uh, or I'm sorry, Murloc Warlock could actually be, you know, decent. Decent to play. There's just better, there's actually a better Murloc deck, but certainly better aggressive decks out there. Um, I do think you might have the option of possibly surprising your opponent. If I see Warlock on the ladder, I'm just going to assume it's Curse Warlock. Could get uh, maybe some small advantage in the mulligan. People mulligan incorrectly when you're actually going to be going aggressive with Murlocs. Um, that's something that doesn't get talked about again. You know, the mental side and the mental advantage that maybe you can squirrel away. If you just never see Murloc Warlock in your uh, bracket on the ladder, you know, kind of in your own pocket meta, it'd be interesting to play it just to see how well you could do with it because other people, um, you know, not going to expect it. And again, they may just mulligan incorrectly. Um, Hunter, I bet you didn't expect Hunter to be the class that's uh, the strongest at using uh, Renathal in the format, but it's a fact. Big Beast Hunter is good. Big Beast Hunter with Renathal is very good. One of the two best choices to climb to Legend with. So uh, they're saying that Big Beast Hunter with Renathal is an excellent deck to climb to Legend. Games will be a little bit slower, though, so be, be aware of that. Respectively, good deck at higher levels of play is only going to get better as Renathal takes over. So uh, still a little bit of uh, muddy water in the data. But as Renathal uh, becomes more popular with Big Beast Hunter, that deck is actually going to show a little bit stronger win rate. So that's interesting as well. Quest Hunter's performance and matchup spread are undergoing drastic change that this report cannot fully capture. I actually had a day where Quest Hunter was my most popular adversary on the ladder. And I've actually started playing Quest Hunter, the 40-card version. And uh, it's interesting, and it feels pretty good. Um, I just destroy rogues, uh, but... You know, just unable to beat those Prestor Druids uh, has been my personal experience. Thanks to Renathal, this archetype is in the midst of a huge spike in win rate. It exhibits Tier 1 aspirations. Only potential roadblock here is the popularity of Druid, as you see they say here. Should this class decline, we suspect it will to some degree. Quest Hunter could represent the strongest list of 40 cards on the ladder. So, potentially, uh, Quest Hunter could be the best 40 card list on the ladder. And, uh... Other than that, it looks like Big Beast Hunter is the best 40-card list on the ladder. Um, and then, of course, you do have Druid and Priest out there as well. Druid maybe doesn't get enough, uh, I don't know, enough respect here. I know they're, they're looking at the data, and this entire report is based on the data that they've collected. But, of course, Vicious Syndicate doesn't collect all data, which means they don't collect all perspectives. And, uh, you know, they're just analyzing what they have access to. I think Druid might be a little bit stronger than what's represented in their report here. That Lady Prester 40-card Renathal deck um, does seem pretty strong. And I do think there are, uh, you know, maybe uh, the skill cap isn't as low as, you know, some people might seem to think it is. Uh, those who have hailed Renathal as a promoter of value-centric control decks before its release must be thrilled with the return of one of the most notorious Stormwind quest lines in top-tier play. Uh, Demon Hunter, Fell Demon Hunter doing fine. Demon Hunter players should not fear the Renathal decks. People have shot away from uh, Fell Demon Hunter just because the extra 10 health. Uh, I guess they thought they couldn't get there. Uh, Fell Demon Hunter does well against every Renathal deck that sits back and tries to survive. The damage is too much for them to handle most of the time, and starting at 40 isn't enough. So, um, Fell Demon Hunter, it's not hurting for damage. The difference between 30 and 40 just isn't enough to make Fell Demon Hunter bad. Renathal decks should come to fear. Uh, Renathal decks you should fear come from the Hunter class because it's a race and you're starting 10 meters back. Um, it can definitely be tough to get there against like Big Beast Hunter, I think, with uh, with Bell Demon Hunter, and certainly when they have an extra 10 health, as noted here. Holy Paladin, one deck that's suffering from the presence of uh, from the prevalence of weird Renathal decks. 
40 health total makes it harder for Paladin to finish off your opponent with a buffed Smite, and the never-ending deck is difficult to outlast. The situation should get better for the deck since many of its counters are expected to decline. We can already see its performance peak at Top Legend, where meta developments are more advanced. All that really means is um, a lot of the experimentation takes place in High Legend. Those are, you know, of course, the best players on the server in the world, and they're also playing more than anyone else. So typically, you see decks develop first at Legend, and then it kind of works its way down the ranks as more people get exposed to it, as more people see tweets, more people see YouTube videos, so on and so forth. Um, those people are playing the most, so that's where, you know, the, the developments occur. Uh, Mech Paladin is a strong deck throughout most of the ladder, but takes a dumpster dive at Top Legend. I think we've talked about that enough already. Nothing we haven't seen before. If you want to counter Druid, Murloc Shaman is the superior choice, but, you know, nothing wrong with Mech Paladin. If that's what your collection allows, if it's a deck you like, you know, you're definitely going to be able to climb all the way up until you start to get into the Legend, and uh, especially those higher Legend ranks. Uh, Control Warrior is unplayable. Thank you. Uh, current field is impossible to deal with for a deck that relies on a pure removal game plan to win and lost its strong cheese potential. Quest Warrior is forgettable. I actually had some success on my climb back to Legend this month. I played a lot of Quest Warrior and actually did pretty well with it. So it was early in the month. It was earlier in the uh, Renathal days. Um, I think maybe I was just taking advantage of some bad Renathal decks, but I was just destroying people with it. They couldn't kill me. Uh, I was still getting the quest reward down, turn 7, turn 8 every game, and then you have the inevitability once you have, uh, you know, that boat on the board and the weapons and the damage every time. So even with the nerfs, uh, early on I found Quest Warrior to be, you know, not necessarily forgettable. Um, I think I did okay with it. I don't exactly have those stats, though, but I'm sure it was better than, than uh, you know, a 50% win rate deck, at least at that time. So, you know, if you're a warrior enthusiast and you like Quest Warrior, don't necessarily give up on it, but don't set your expectations too high. And uh, they end the report with Warrior seems irrelevant. I'm going to skip over the class-specific list. Um, they go into more uh, more details about the class, and uh, you can also find the Vicious Syndicate versions of the decks here. If you're looking for a new deck or just looking for a strong deck, this is a great place to come, get a little additional insight, and then uh, they'll have their, uh, their decks as well. And uh, just to take a look at this, you know, so you can see it, you click on it, it opens up the list, and then they've got a copy deck code just right here to be able to make it easy to get that into your Hearthstone client. I will leave that to you if you're interested. And they always conclude their report with the Meta Breaker of the Week. Big Spell Mage is the strongest, most well-rounded deck on the ladder based on its great, per, uh, great performance at all rank brackets. You can't go wrong with this no matter where you are on the ladder. <laughs> Which is exactly what they say. It's hard to go wrong with it. It's just good. Uh... If you're thirsty for a Renathal deck, Quest Hunter might offer you the best one. Turns out Renathal has synergy with quest lines, and having more life means you can ignore your opponent attempting to play Hearthstone and shoot them in the face harder, much degeneracy. So, Meta Breaker of the Week, um, Big Spell Mage, I guess it's kind of not meta anymore, even though it's been out there all along. And then Quest Hunter, I've actually been playing Quest Hunter. It is enjoyable, uh, although Quest Hunter for me does get a little bit monotonous and a little bit boring. Uh, one thing that I'll say about Quest Hunter, specifically from my experience, in the mulligan, I think you're still looking for cheap damage spells. I don't think you can necessarily target anything specific that you want in the mulligan, any type of specific spell or a card. Uh, when you have these 40-card Renathal decks, it's just harder to find what you want in your mulligan, so you're basically looking for cards that are, this is okay, I can get by with this. That's going to do it for the Vicious Syndicate Meta Report Review for this week. I am uncorrupt. Good luck out on the ladder.